Newton's laws of motion. First, let me tell you a little bit about Mr. Isaac Newton. He was an extremely intelligent man. He lived back in the 1700s. And he's considered to be what we call the father of classical physics. Classical physics is all of the parts of physics that were discovered and experimented upon up until about the late 1800s. And at that point, we started to change our view. We were able to build more sensitive equipment and machines that could observe and test the world at levels that we never could see before. And that's when we started to notice a whole new window into the world of how things work. And we developed uh, modern physics. But modern physics is still based on all the work of classical physics. And this fellow right here is the guy who really set us all on the right path father of classical physics. You cannot study physics without understanding the contributions of Isaac Newton. Isaac Newton's work was enough for us to be able to put a man on the moon. Now think about that. We have an earth which is spinning. We have a moon which is also spinning. But the moon is moving in a circle around the earth and the Earth is moving in a circle around the Sun. And imagine trying to throw a baseball on a spinning Earth that's moving, and then try to hit a moon that's spinning and moving. It's very complicated. And yet, Isaac Newton's theories and laws of motion are all we needed to be able to throw a rocket ship to a spot where we knew the moon would be, despite all the spinning and motion so these rules are phenomenal, and we still use them today, and they are invaluable in understanding how our world works. So let's begin with Newton's first law of motion. The first law of motion is based on something that Newton observed. He noticed at first what he thought were three different kinds of motion. Let's think about three different ways things can move. Things can be stopped, and not apparently moving at all, or sometimes we say they are at rest. Or things could be moving at a certain velocity, but that velocity is not changing. So imagine a car driving along the highway at 60 kilometers per hour, and the speed staying right at 60. It's just cruising along. The speed is not changing, so we say that it's moving at a constant speed or velocity if we want to consider the direction, which we should. Everything is really a vector in physics, just about anyway, and so we should consider it. But the other thing that you can do is you can step on the gas pedal. And if you're going 60 and you want to pass a car, you can step on the gas pedal and speed up. Or you can hit the brakes and slow down, which means you're changing your speed. It's possible to change our speed. So a changing speed or velocity, let's use changing velocity, is a, something that we call acceleration or accelerating. And of course, we sometimes use the word, my spelling's not very good, that's an L, not a T, this is where the T is supposed to go, but I think you can get it, it's the word accelerating, right? And if spelling is not your thing, I'll write it properly here, accelerating, that's better. Spelling is important. The other word we sometimes use in English is decelerating, which means slowing down. And we can use that in physics, too, but we'll talk more about how we describe those things in another video. But we all get the idea that these involve changing our speed or velocity. Now, here's something that's interesting. Let's just carry this little chart down a little bit further. 
And let's look at these first two. Stop that rest means that your velocity, call it v, and we'll put a vector sign on that, equals zero. You're not moving meters per second. And of course, if you're not moving, you have no direction. So stopped and at rest is very easy to describe. And if you were stopped for a long time, your velocity would stay at zero meters per second. If you were moving, you could be moving at some speed. Let's say you were moving along at 10 meters per second. But if you didn't change that, that would be what we call a constant velocity. You stayed at 10 for a long time. Well, what's the difference between staying at 10 for a long time and staying at zero for a long time? Well, Isaac Newton realized that there is no difference between these two. A constant speed of zero is still a constant speed. And so these two types of motion, although they look a little bit different, are actually the same thing in physics and in our world. They are both constant speeds. So constant speed can be any number, including zero. So if we look at this now, we have two kinds of motion. There is really only two kinds of motion. And they are moving at a constant speed, which could be zero. And accelerating or decelerating. Accelerating. We'll spell it right this time. These are the two types of motion that can exist. And Isaac Newton realized this. And then he decided to figure out what's the difference between these two. And so his laws are what tell us the difference. The first thing he noticed was that if you're moving at a constant speed, you're probably going to stay that way unless something makes you change. Objects have a tendency to stay or remain doing whatever they're doing. Objects have a tendency to remain in their current state of motion. He realized that if I'm moving along at a constant speed, let's say I'm riding my horse back in Newton's day, and I'm riding my horse and I'm galloping along at a constant speed, in order for me to make my speed change, I would have to do something. I have to spank the horse on the hindquarters and cause the horse to exert a greater force, to push harder and run faster. And so the first thing Newton realized was that it's all about forces. Forces are what changes the motion of objects. Forces change the motion of objects. So he wrote this down in a kind of uh, a more clear and concise way. He said that an object moving at a constant speed And that constant speed could be zero. So this could also be just staying still. Will remain that way. It won't change. Unless it is acted on or acted upon. Let's use the word upon by some kind of force. And he had to make a little clarification here. An unbalanced force. This is Newton's first 
law of motion. An object moving at a constant speed will remain that way unless it is acted upon by an unbalanced force. Now there's many ways to word this. One of the more common ways of writing this is a bit of a shorter version and it says that an object at rest will tend to stay at rest and an object in motion will tend to stay in motion unless acted upon by an unbalanced force. That particular way of saying things is okay if you understand all the details and, and the finer points, but I worded it this way to make it a little more clear. First of all, we don't need to distinguish between an object at rest and an object at constant motion, because we already described that, and we realize that constant speed could be moving at 7 or 8 or 9 or 100 kilometers an hour, but it could also be zero, so they're the same thing. So this sentence, an object moving at constant speed, that includes moving at a speed of zero or just sitting still. Now, the other word that's kind of interesting is unbalanced force. Let's talk a little bit about what that might mean. Well, you can have an object, like this box, and if somebody pulls on it this way with a force, say on a rope that's attached, well, we know that the box might start to move. But if somebody pulls the other way with the exact same force, it's like a tug of war, and nobody wins. And so if the forces are equal, the box might not move. This is what we would call a balanced force, because the forces are balanced out, balanced force, and that means that there will be no change in motion. No change in motion. So we can't just say acted upon by a force, because this block right here is definitely acted upon by a force. In fact, it's acted upon by two forces, but they, they cancel out. In order to make it move, we would have to have one person pull much harder with a very large force, and the other person pull with a very small force. And these forces are unbalanced. You can see that definitely the guy on the right hand side is winning the tug of war. So unbalanced force is what causes a change in motion. Unbalanced force changes motion. So you have to think of forces like a tug of war. And somebody has to win the tug of war. Another word we commonly use for unbalanced force is the word net force. Net force, the word net is used in accounting, and it means when you add everything up, it's like the sum or the total. So if we look at the picture, we can see that the net force would be this force plus that force. But because they're in opposite directions, one would be like subtracting from the other. And the net force would be zero. There would be no overall force acting on the block because the two would cancel out. But in the other situation, we would see that somebody here would definitely win. The person pulling on the right-hand side is winning the tug of war, which means there is a net force. It has to be something not zero, not equal to zero. And we'll talk about how we can figure out what those forces might be and how much they might be a little bit later on. That is what Newton's first law is all about. Basically saying that if you want to cause something to accelerate, you have to have a net force applied to it. The tendency the tendency to remain doing whatever you were doing, to remain at a constant speed or velocity, It's called something. This tendency has a special name. It's called inertia. Inertia. So that's a big fancy word that we use. And so sometimes Newton's first law is called the law of inertia because it's talking about the idea that things tend to stay at a constant speed unless somebody applies an unbalanced force to them and causes their motion to change. So Newton's first law, or sometimes as it's called, 
the law of inertia. And if we go back up to where we wrote it down, Newton's law can be worded, an object moving at constant speed will remain that way unless it is acted upon by an unbalanced force. This is something you should commit to memory because it will be one of the three laws that are used to analyze all of the problems that involve forces in motion. Next time, we'll talk about Newton's second law.